Okay, this is the study guide video for the last practice test if you missed more than zero or one. So here we go. For this, you need to make sure you listen for the six words. There's going to be six words. Please do not share these with anybody. All right, so here we go. First problem. So the two ways to get from what we call the pre-image. Remember the pre-image is where it starts. The pre-image is the starting line. The image where it's going to is the finish line. So remember, pre-image, that's where it's starting. Image, that's where it's going to. And I can tell by these little marks right here, that's the image after the move. The letters without the marks is before the move, the pre-image. So one way of doing this is reflecting it over the y-axis, the up and down axis. So one, two, three, four, equal distance. One, two, three, four, equal distance over the line you're reflecting. So that other point will be equal distance. The last part of the triangle, eight boxes on this side. So that's when I reflect it first across the y-axis. And then you can see this is a quarter turn going 90 degrees, quarter turn to the right. 90 degrees to the right is clockwise. So one way of describing this would be a reflection. You gotta make sure you use proper words. Reflection across, gotta tell the line you're reflecting across the y-axis, first step. Then a rotation, gotta say rotation, you can't say spin, rotation 90 degrees, give me the direction clockwise. That's 90 degrees, quarter turn to the right. Another way of doing this would be reflecting it across the y-axis first, I'm sorry, the x-axis, and then a quarter turn not to the right, looking down at this, but a quarter turn to the left. So another way, of course, reflection across the x-axis. And if you said that, you'd have to then a rotation 90 degrees. That would be counterclockwise to the left. I know it looks weird looking at it. it looks kind of like you're going another drift. That's to the left looking down. All right, next problem. Here we go. D is a midpoint of line segment BC, which is this line segment right there. And you can see there's no way that would be true. So that would be false. D is a midpoint of DC. And again, that, that's can't be the midpoint of that line piece right there. D is the midpoint of the line segment AC, this line segment all the way from point A to point C. That's this right here. And it's saying D is a midpoint of it. That's right in the middle. See, that is true. All right, next, line segment DC. So that's this line segment right here bisects that whole long, and you can see that's not true, that would be false. AC bisects the whole line segment EB from here to here. It slices it in half at this spot right here. That, that's not true. AC slices in half, bisects midpoint right in the middle of ED at this same spot D. And you can see that would be true. First word is red. Red. All right, second, third problem. Here we go. Rigid motion does not carry. That would be a no. Of course, if it says does carry, then that would be a yes, but does not carry, no. Two corresponding angles, that would almost be enough but I would need also a corresponding side to make that angle-angle side. That would be a no. Of course, if it was 
angle 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 that's similar not congruent that would be a no too but with just those two parts that's going to be a no three pairs of sides side 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 yep that would be a yes different than angle 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 which is similar side 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 for sure congruent next three sides are proportional that means again you have two triangles or sides that they're bigger or smaller, but they're proportionally bigger or smaller. That is not congruent. Similar is not congruent. Congruent is equal in every way. So that's just similar. That would be a no. All right, here we go. Next, side angle side for sure. Side angle side. An angle between two consecutive sides. That's for sure a true statement. That would be congruent. Angle side side again two angles in a row consecutive with a side that is true what would make that false of course is angle with two consecutive sides don't want to do that one. a rotation and if i can show you real quick a rotation should get it to cover itself up exactly if i can get this going so if i take that triangle and rotate it right around the middle, you can see in one 360 rotation, it covers itself up exactly. Or is that 360? That looks like in one 180 degree rotation. So that would be true. And then the last one, a reflection. Remember, there's no way I can reflect. There's no way I can reflect where it is can't do it so that would be false all right rolling on next problems are going to be compass and ruler problems so i will try my best to do these hoping you had a compass and ruler to do so here i go so an angle bisector of course the only one that's an angle bisector is this guy right here and I'm going to try to show you why that is, why the other ones don't have that. So if I take my compass, put the point at the base or the tip of the angle itself, I'm trying to cut in half. I'm going to stretch it in a way that's not too long, not too small, just about half of those letters right there. And I'm going to draw my initial measuring arc or placement arc. Now I pick up my compass, put my tip at one of those ends where that first arc I drew touched that line segment. And now I need to take my compass and measure this exact opening. Sometimes I gotta stretch it out a little bit. Sometimes I gotta make it smaller, make it bigger. I need to make sure it measures that physically exactly so you can see I had to stretch mine out a tiny little bit now with your tip right where it is take your compass swing it out a little bit and you're gonna draw an arc out here in space now picking up your compass leaving it that size do not change the size put the tip on the other spot that first arc you drew touch that line down there and swing another arc. Now take your straight edge and draw a line from the very, very tip of that angle or the vertex of that angle or the opening, that very, very corner of that angle. Draw a line best you can. And then you can see that that cuts this into two perfectly sized angles. If you measured them, those would be the same measurement. All right, line bisector. If you're doing a line perpendicular line bisector, of course, this one would be this guy right here. Let me show you how that works. So take my compass, put the tip Remember, you need to measure that all-important over half. Half of the 
distance of the line piece you're trying to slice in half. You don't want to go under half. You want to go too small. That won't work. Don't want to go too big. You want to be just over half of that line segment that you're trying to slice in half. So now leaving my tip right where it is, now I swing an arc out here in space and then swing one down below. You could draw a whole half circle if you want or you could just draw a little partials as long as they intersect and I'll show you that. So now you pick up your compass and you put the tip on the other end of that line segment on the opposite end and then you swing another little arc out in space so it overlaps with that first one that you drew and then you take your straight edge and you draw a line right where those line segments touch exactly and sometimes it's hard with my board here but it looks like I got it right there and that cuts this into two equal parts two equal line segment parts where the other one cut it into two angle parts all right next word second word is wave wave let's move on here we go All right, for these, these are your shift problems. For this problem right here, I give you the original. This is the pre-image. This is the starting line. Going to the image, the finish line, which is this one where it finishes. So the way this is set up, I'm giving you the finish line where it's ending. And I'm also showing you where it's gonna start, even though it's not on the graph. So we want you to know that if this was on the graph, that would be at one, two, three, four boxes up the y-axis, and then that same slope of over one, down two, over one, down two, that's what that slope of negative two is. I go from that four, right one, down two, right one, down two, that would be my starting line that's where it starts and then what I do is I count boxes from that starting line position four up to its finish line on this graph and what I can see is if I back up a little bit that looks like it's going up one two three four five going up five boxes so the way this one's set up I have a shift up five or technically k equals five or technically oh, we'll move on that's a shift up of five all right next one the way this one's set up i'm giving you again the original the starting line the pre-image where it starts and we're asking you to graph the finish line graph this finish line that's been shoved up six. That doesn't tell you where it's gonna be, but that just tells you where it moves up. So for this problem, starting at X minus one, that's the slope of one over one, negative one. That's a line like this, over one, up one, over one, up one. That would be this line right here. That would be my starting line at negative one. And it's saying to shift up Six, six up on the y-axis. One, two, three, four, five, six. You can see it right there. Remember, this problem wants you only to graph with two points this finish line. So your final product on this would be a point, not on six. That doesn't tell you where to put your y-intercept point for the new line, the finish line just tells you that in this form tells you how to move it up or down. So from negative one, moving up six, my first point will be on five. And then following that same slope of right one, up one, my second point 
would be right here. And then I'm going to draw a line through those two. Remember, you don't want two lines on here. So your finished product will be minus this. That will be maybe this. Try to just help you out to see where you're starting and how far up you're moving. But that would be the final product right there. That's my finish line. That is G of X. Whoops. That is after I take my pre-image line, 1x minus 1, and shove it up 6. So you can see g of x, the equation really, 1x plus 5. And I got that when I substituted that in there. All right, let's move on. Number 8. For this one, I want another point, and I would suggest making this a square. So if I look at this, I got 2 to the right, and I'm going down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Is that going down 6? Let me back up a little bit. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Yes, looks like right 2, down 6. That's a slope of negative 6 over 2, a slope of negative three. If you do a square, should be opposite reciprocal. So it should be two over six. One, two, three, four, five, six, up to you. So yes, that is a square. So here we go. You could repeat that pattern, but knowing from C, you want to go kind of the opposite. I want to go left two, up six. And even though I'm going left 2 up 6, that's still equivalent. That's still negative 6 over 2. So from C, go left 2 up 6. And if I see that correctly, that should be negative 2, 6. Let's mark that. That is my... Point D, that is my suggestion point for you guys to make this a square, negative 2, 6. Going left 2, up 6, which, of course, gives you that same slope pattern of negative 6 over 2, which is negative 3. Gives you that same parallel, which you need. A square is a parallelogram 2. So knowing that, that point, that point I could choose being negative two, six, I need to prove that this is a, let's just say parallelogram or a square. And you're gonna do that by talking about the slope of the line through these points. The slope of a line through point A, B, a slope of a line through points D, C. And then you're gonna talk about the slope of a line through A, D, and the slope of a line between B and C. That's what I need to see. So you can see the slopes and we'll just say lines A, B, line segment or line, line through A, B and D, C are both negative 6 over 3. And then I can see the slopes of the line to the other parts this being a square, that will be opposite reciprocal slopes of the line through AD and BC is the opposite reciprocal of that. I'm sorry, not 6 over negative. That's going to be 2. Let's fix that. So that would be negative 6 over 2. Opposite reciprocal, positive 2 over 6. All right, hopefully you're seeing that for each of this. The parallelogram or the square going right two down six the other way right three I'm sorry right six up two of course if you really wanted to on this problem you could have done the other one and gone right two down six let me try to show you that to make this a parallelogram I could have also went from C right to down six, right here. If I chose that, 
it would have been just a little bit harder because the two slopes of the lines would have not been opposite reciprocals. They would have been just parallelogram slopes. That would have been like slope of AB. And I call this another CD. That would still be negative 6 over 2. But the other slope would be a little bit more weird between AC and BD. Looks like that slope would be right 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Right six, right eight, down one, two, three, four. So it looks like another weird slope of right eight down four, which is negative four over eight. Not many people would like to approach that. Right one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, down four. So again, I would choose this one up here. That makes it a nice square opposite reciprocals. All right, let's keep rolling. This one, choose the perpendicular lines. So perpendicular lines are when you have equations with the number in front of x, the slope number, having it be an opposite reciprocal, something like this, where the two numbers in front of x have opposite reciprocals, where if you put both of them in fraction form, they are clearly the flip-flop opposite, not only flip-flop, but One's positive, one's negative. And you can see the only choice out there that works for this is point C, where this is one over three, and then I have the negative three, not in fraction form, but if you put it in fraction form over one, there it is, negative three over one. A little tricky, remember, you gotta put those in fraction forms of their whole numbers if you wanna truly see what you're looking at there. All right, let's move on. <clears throat> Number 11. All right, two lines perpendicular. The slope of the line is 3 fourths. What would be a slope of a second line perpendicular to it? So again, it's the concept of 3 fourths being flip-flopped and opposite. So the opposite of positive 3 fourths, negative and then that flip-flop, negative four-thirds. So you can see that would be this one right here. All right, moving on. Finding the perimeter, counting boxes. This part of my triangle, if I slice it, lets me count. Two boxes here, one, two, three, three here, my upper part, one, two, three, four, five, six boxes tall. I could see that finding the perimeter, I'm going to have three parts of this triangle from here to here, all the way up, and then all the way down, perimeter. I could see that the base of my perimeter, 2 plus 3, that's where I'm getting that 5 number. The base of my triangle, I can see already, is 5, 5 boxes. Now I need to find the other parts using the Pythagorean theorem using the, these two bases in the Pythagorean theorem, which of course is c squared equals a squared plus b squared. So to find that first length c, I'm gonna use two and six. So c squared, you write it, put that two there, square it, square that six, gives me four, and then remember not 12, six times six, 36 gives me 40, and now I use my calculator, to square root that, which gives me 6.3. Do the other part, c squared equals 3 squared plus 6 squared, c squared equals 9 plus 36, C squared equals 9 plus 36 is 45. Should have put this part right here, trying to go a little bit too fast. Show this part where you're square rooting that. Show me that. Show me your square rooting this. These will cancel. And this one, if I square root it, show you how to round. I'm trying to slow down a little bit, sorry. This one gives me 
0.7082. Remember rounding, both these have been rounded. Round to the first decimal place. This tells me not to round it up, to leave that 6.7. When I did square root of 40, using my calculator, that gave me 6.324, and again, not enough to round that three up, so I left it 6.3. So now when I add these up, five plus 6.3, plus 6.7 gives me the approximate five, approximately how many boxes. That gives me 18. All right, next word is black. Black, let's keep rolling. 13, remember this one, the way to set it up. Write those numbers down. Know that you have 10 of them. So I got 100 right here as a given. I got 103. I have 104. Let's write that a little smaller. I also give you a 106. I give you a 110. I give you a 111. 113. 1. 18 and 119 and looks like I need you to write on here 120 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 that should be right here should be the whisker so change that I'm not sure why I drew that whisker too long right there so let's erase that so just remember, it should really look like that. I'm not sure why I extended that whisker out to 20. <clears throat> so here we go. Hopefully that is nine. I got <clears throat> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, so that means what I've given you, I've given you some halfway numbers. This halfway number. I've given you this halfway number. I've given you this halfway number between so I can see what I've given you here. Looks like this top part, I've given you all five numbers. I have two numbers to the left of 113, two numbers to the right of 113. I got 110 in the middle of 106. 110 plus 106, if I add them up and divide by two, gives me 108. I can see that down here, I have four where a middle number has two to the right, but is missing a spot right here. There's my hole. So if I had to pick another number in here to make this one work, I believe another number would be 100 or 101, 102. Let's go 102. Remember any of those numbers, 100 would work. 101 would work. 102 would work. 103 would also not shift anything around. So I'm just going 102. Hopefully I set that one on right. All right, here we go next. This one says the range of the high temperatures is bigger than the range of the low. And I can see clearly the range of the high temperature right here is not nearly as long. If I took those numbers and subtracted I would see that from 75 to 30, which I believe is 45, the range of the low one, which looks like 45, that is bigger than this range of the high one, which is from 70 to 40, which looks like about a range of 30. So that would be a false statement the way I wrote that. The range of the high one is bigger than the low. So the way this is written, that would be false. All right, the difference between the medians, this says for the way this is written, 10. And here, the line in the middle of the box, that is my median. The line in the middle of my box, remember now that we're looking at it, tells me how the data skewed. If that median's to the left, that means most of the data's to the left here, 
that's skewed to the right. If my median in the middle of the box is to the right here, my more scores are higher, that's a skew to the left. Remember how those look. All right, so this one, the difference between my two median numbers for this problem looks like the difference is five. So for that, at least 10, that would be false. And then the last one, it says the interquartile range of the larger, let's see, the high temperature is larger than the interquartile range. And remember this stretch right here from the bottom of the box to the top of the box, that's the interquartile range. By measuring, you can see, or by this one looking at it, the quartile range for the high temperatures is lower, let's see, larger. So the way this is written, I believe this one is false. Yep. If, of course, this was stretched out and this box was bigger, then I believe that one would be true. All right, let's move on. 15, for this one, remember, I want you to pick a couple and describe them here. So if I pick this one, I can see the way this one's written. This would be one where if I did a box and whisker plot, my median would be shoved over here to the left, more scores to the left. And remember that, the way it looks, is what we call a right skew, maybe because the data kind of tails off to the right. If I compare that to this one, which would have the median box in the middle, have it shoved to the right, that means more scores to the right, that is a left skew, maybe because it's tailing off to the left as the data. So compare a couple. If you're comparing one of these middle ones, that's one where my box in the middle would have the median right in the middle as might in the middle as you could. So a normal skew where it goes up and down, perfectly bell curve. So whatever ones you compare, talk about the skew, talk about how it's to the right. So if I did class A, that would be a skew to the left. Or again, I'm just gonna say it, I'm not gonna type it here, or maybe I should type it. So if I was to compare and type that well, I would say down here. Class A shows a skew to the left or has the median more to the right. This means more high scores. Class B shows no skew or has the median in the middle. That just means equal high scores and low scores. So again, when you're writing this up, describe to me how it is, how it's skewed left or right. Talk about the median, talk about the box, talk about how the median shoved to the right, how the medians move to the left, what that means. All right, next word is fish, fish. All right, let's keep rolling. For this next one here, this one a little bit more difficult, but this one has you compare some numbers. It says Spencer won the election with 50% of the vote. That would be false because I'm taking Spencer, the number of people who voted for Spencer and dividing it by this 400 right here. So that would be 300 divided by 400. 
that would be 75%. So that one is false. All right, next one says 20% of the 12th graders, if I can read this, let me pause that to get my glasses. All right, I'm back. So again, first one says Spencer won the election with exactly 50% of the votes. So that means total votes. That's why I divided the number that voted for Spencer all the people voted for Spencer, total Spencer votes by the total votes. Next says approximately 20% of 12th graders voted for Spencer. So if you look, you wanna see at 12th graders, how many 12th graders you have there. So it looks like I have 10. It looks like the total of 12th graders is 50. So if I'm comparing 10 to 50, 10 12th graders of the 50 total 12th graders that voted, 20% voted for Spencer. So if I do 10 divided by 50, that gives me 20%. That's why this one works right here. All right, next. It says exactly 40% of students who voted in the election were 11th or 12th graders. So the way that one works, 40% of students, total students, are 11th or 12th. So I look at total students, 11th or 12th, looks like would be this total right here. That's the total number of students, 11th or 12th graders, that voted. And then, then this is comparing to the total. So that would be 200 divided by 400. That would be 50%. So that one is false. All right, last one says 30% of students who voted for Jules. So if I look for total students who voted for Jules, that's 100. And it's saying we're ninth or 10th graders. So I look at this number right here of total ninth or 10th graders, that would be 30. And then 30 divided by, that gives me 30%. That's why this one works. So those are tricky. All right, let's keep rolling. Next one, filling in the numbers. Get my capsule here. All right. So this one, I give you the total. The total is 400. That's this number right here. Now it says 30% do not like ice cream. So I take 30% as a decimal, which is 0.3, and I times that by the total number, by 400. So my first times in 0.3, which is 30% as a decimal, times 400 gives me 120, and that is the total of do not like ice cream. So I put that number right here. 120 students total do not like ice cream. The total is to the far right for that. One tenth, if I take one tenth and change that to a decimal by doing one divided by 10, that gives me 0.1. And if I times that by that same total number, you're gonna do that twice. That gives me 40, and that is a specific one. That is, do not like ice cream and do not like cake. So you gotta find the where that spot intersects. Do not like ice cream, do not like cake. That 40 goes right here. And then the last one, 100 students like ice cream. So that would be, oh, I'm sorry, 100 students like cake, so that is, in the bottom of the light cake. And now I use the math to fill in the blanks, knowing that adding across is gonna give me 400. Adding down gives me 400. Use reverse algebra. If I take 400 minus 100, that gives me this number right here. It's gotta be 300, and I get that again by subtracting. That's the only way I can get that. And then going up and down, 
400 minus 120 gives me 280. Going across here, the only number that would give me 120 with 40 would be 80. Going down, this would have to be 20. And then finally going across, this would have to be 260. It should add up. 20 plus 80 gives me 100, perfect. 20 plus 260, 280, perfect. Adding across, adding down should work perfect. All right, let's move on. This one says, describe the slope. Remember, slope is rise over run. The rise is the change in the Y, or the Y, this is pounds over the change in the X, which is this one, inches. So you gotta make sure you know that the rise number is the change in pounds. The bottom number, the run number, is the change in inches. That slope number, which is always the number in front of X, I don't care if it's a decimal or not, you could write it as a fraction over one. That top number shows that 2.3 is the change, 2.3, pounds and then the bottom is inch so the slope if i was to draw a line through here every time i go over one inch it's increasing by 2.3 pounds that's what you need to know all right move on second to last word is blue blue for this one describe the y-intercept so for this one Remember, y-intercept by definition is when x is zero wherever the y numbers touch in the y-axis. So this is my y-axis, x-axis, that would be 10. So of course that is units. x, we are the x units, that would be time. And for this, y, y units, test scores. So that 0, 10, remember that's specific. That means at 0 hours or after 0 hours, the test score is 100. I'm sorry, test score is 10. Or what this means by looking at it, someone who does not study in this data set scores about a 10. Someone who studies five hours looking up here gets a 90. Looks like if you kept spreading this line out, looks like about six hours of studying to get you 100%. All right, here we go. This one, if I can grab my paper so I can see. Almost done. All right, it says, Archie's line fits his line better than Nate's line. That means his number is going to be either closer to 1 or closer to negative 1. Remember, anything close to negative 1 is perfect downhill. Anything 1, perfect up. Anything less is not quite perfect, but almost, remember. So you're looking for that far end of the scale. It's better. So if I look, Archie's line. Archie's line is 0.99, Nate's line is 0.9, that would be true right away. Looks like the other ones, Serena's line, 0.75 better than Jaina, not true. 0.75 is not closer to one or negative one. Nate's line better than Jaina's, not true. Nate's negative 0 0.9, 0 0.91, that is false to you. All right, last one. For this one, I could see that I have a perfect positive one, almost the closest one to positive one, 0.99. All right, next, I could see this one going uphill, not quite perfect, but of these choices, looks like best one, 0.85. All right, this one, super spread out. That would be totally the one in the middle. Remember, zero is when it's all spread out in the middle. One perfect positive, 
negative one perfect negative, everything else is in between. So that would be the 0 0.05 one. And then the last one, negative, not quite 0.3, looks like negative, not quite 0.98, that would be perfection. I would go for negative 0 0.80. All right, hopefully you heard this. Hopefully this helps. The last word is pelican. Pelican. Good luck.